Good day everyone. For this particular video, we'll be discussing about the abiotic components of an ecosystem or the non-living components of an ecosystem, particularly sunlight, water, winds, and temperature. So just a general overview, these are the different abiotic components of the ecosystem. We have temperature, sunlight, water, pH, level, rainfall, rock, wind, salinity, or the amount of salt, and also your soil. Sunlight, or light energy, is a primary source of energy in nearly all ecosystems. Energy used by the green plants during photosynthesis, by which plants gather energy from sunlight and uses energy to make carbohydrates from atmospheric carbon dioxide and water. So our reactants to produce carbohydrates and also oxygen as byproduct are your carbon dioxide from the air and also water from the soil. So we have the term here, photoperiodism, which is the response of plants to day and night. The next component would be water. Water is said to be the universal solvent and the basis of all life on our planet. Without water, it's almost impossible for us to have life. And it's very important for our own survival also as humans. It covers more than three-fourths of the Earth's surface, 97% of which is actually salt water and 3% of which is actually fresh water. And out of this 3%, only 2% of it is in solid form, found in ice caps and glaciers. So majority of fresh water is frozen in ice. And 1% out of this 3% is actually the Earth's water in a form of usable for humans and also for land animals. So drinking water is only 1% out of 3% that is actually fresh water. So these are the different group of plants according to their water needs. We have the hydrophytes, which are the water-loving plants, such as your water lilies in this particular picture. You also have the mesophytes, which are moderate water-loving plants in this picture. Epiphytes get their water from the air, such as your orchids, hanging on the tree. We have the xerophytes, plants loving dry condition in the desert, for example. We have your cactus. And halophytes, which are actually saltwater-loving plants, such as your mangroves near the sea. So these are the different properties of water which make it very ideal for consumption as humans and also for other organisms. Water is a universal solvent. It has high specific heat capacity. It has high latent heat of vaporization. It has low viscosity, therefore it could easily blow and move from one location to another. It has high cohesion and adhesion of water. So we have the term surface tension. Lower density in solid state. That's why it's very good or a very ideal for water to have a low density in solid state so that the lake will not be frozen entirely. It will be only frozen at the surface. It has ionization of water. These are the importance of water for human consumption or for human needs. First is in agriculture, the important, it is most important for the agriculture is for irrigation use and also for drinking, of course. Body, our body needs 75% water to do exercise. So if ever we lose water because we do exercise or we do our daily task, we need to take in at least 12 glasses of water for it to be replenished. The next component or abiotic factor would be our temperature. It is actually a measure of hotness or coldness of a body. Environmental temperature is an important abiotic factor because of its effect on the metabolism. So our metabolism also depends on the temperature that we are experiencing. The temperature above 50 degrees Celsius destroys the enzymes of most organisms. So as we can say, as we can see, if we have a uh, winter, some of our um, polar bears are actually hibernating in order for it to minimize metabolism and also to survive the cold winter. The types of individuals based on body temperature, we have two. The first one is poikilotherm, which are cold-blooded animals such as your reptiles, fishes, amphibians, and include also here your insects as also a type of cold-blooded animal. The homeotherms, which are warm-blooded animals, such as 
for mammals and, ver and birds, which are animals capable of temperature regulation within a given range. So from this particular diagram, please consider, this, there are just some error. For warm-blooded, we only have mammals and birds, which are usually having fur and feathers. And for cold-blooded, we have your reptiles, amphibians, and of course, fish. These are the corrective mechanisms in temperature control. We have increased sweating. Corrective response aim to reduce the temperature of the organism. So during a very hot day, we tend to sweat a lot because our body is actually adjusting to the temperature of the surrounding. And the same is true with other animals as well. Next, we have the vasodilation. So corrective response where the blood vessels close to the skin surface become more dilated. Okay, so there is a larger surface area for heat to be lost of the external environment from the blood vessels carrying overheated blood. So when we talk about vasodilation, our blood vessels near our skin are actually expanding in order to promote better heat loss in our body. So we will cool our body down for homeostasis purposes. We also have here vas vasoconstriction, which is actually occurring when temperature in an organism drop. The blood vessels become constricted so that minimal heat loss occurs. So instead, or if we talk about vasodilation, there is expansion in our blood vessels. For vasoconstriction, there is actually constriction or compression of our blood vessels so that minimal heat loss will take place. These are the effects of temperature in plants. Of course, the main one is to manipulate and influence the flowering of plants. And alongside with it, the term thermoperiod, which means a daily temperature change. So some of the effects of high temperature to plants will be the following. Germination, decrease in photosynthetic efficiency, modulation of relative water content, protoplasmic movement, transport of materials, Membrane stability, modulation of hormones, primary and secondary metabolites, seed quality and improper seed filling, oxidative stress for plants, damage to biological macromolecules, and improper nutrient absorption. The next component, the last for this video, would be our wind. It refers to the horizontal movement of the air that tend to equalize lateral difference in the temperature and pressure. So parallel to the Earth's surface, blows from areas of high pressure to low pressure. Remember this, our wind moves from high pressure to low pressure. Bumpy air effect of vertical moving air. So here in the Philippines, we have the so-called monsoons, which are actually large-scale seasonal winds. From June to October, these are your southwest monsoon, or locally known as habagat. Abundant rainfall and ex extensive cloud at the western section of the country. November to February, we have the Northeast Monsoon or the Amihan in the Philippines at the eastern section of the country. So Philippines have a year-round tropical time. So here in the Philippines, we only have two seasons. We have the dry season and also the rainy season. So from this diagram, we will contrast our habagat, and also our amihan. When we talk about habagat, or the southwest monsoon, this is actually the winds coming from the southwest, going to the Philippines. This occurs during June to October, and also, usually, it contains hot and dry, or moist, na hangin mula sa Indian Ocean, and maaring magpalakas ng bagyo. So, as of the moment as filming this video or this particular discussion, we are experiencing habada. That's why we have a lot of typhoons coming in from this particular season. While during February or November to February, we have the Amihan or the Northeast Monsoon. So this particular wind pattern is the Northeast. Coming from the Northeast direction, of course, uh, this is karaniwang nagpapaulan sa silangang bahagi ng bansa. Toyo at malamig na hangin mula sa Siberia. Maaring magpahina ng bagyo dahil wala itong masyadong moisture. 
So if we experience during December, February, and also January, very cold temperature at night because together with the wind are the slowly melting ice in our Siberia and also the China area above the Philippines. And these are just some of the effects of wind on the organisms. We have bacteria, proteins, and many insects that live on snow-covered mountain peaks depend on nutrient blown on them by winds. Many plants depend on the wind to disperse their pollen and seeds. It's very important for pollination and also for flowering plants to continue survival, of course, for reproduction purposes. Local wind damage often create opening in the forest contributing to patchiness in ecosystems. Increases in an organism's rate of water loss by evaporation and of course, it affects the patterns of plant. This is for this particular video. See you on our next video. Thank you.